Out of the seven factors of enlightenment, we have so far just used one, the first one. And as I said already, the first one is the one that opens the door. It is our entrance ticket, mindfulness, paying attention. And it's the kind of attention which is non-judgmental. It's knowing. And when we know, we can also substitute, but without judgment. So we have talked about the fact that mindfulness is purification. It's um, actually synonymous with it. The one way for the purification of beings starts out the saying in the Satipatthana Sutta by the Buddha. Why does it purify? Because when one is mindful and paying full attention, one can neither be hateful nor greedy. One can, of course, immediately start again when one stops being mindful, but not while one is actually being mindful. The word mindfulness is overused and often not understood. It means paying attention, being right there, not flying off into the wild blue yonder or gray yonder out there. So it's not unknown to us. We all use it, but we use it for survival. And that's not good enough on the spiritual path. On the spiritual path, it has to be used for insight, and we have talked about that. And having used it for insight, having seen ourselves in a far more objective manner than we usually do, having possibly been able to put mindfulness ahead and ourselves in the back, me being mindful, leaving the me out and just being mindful. Then we come to the second step of the seven factors of enlightenment. And they're called the investigation into phenomena or the investigation into the three characteristics of existence. Now in Pali, the three characteristics of existence are called Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. And those of you, most of you, have had something to do with Buddhism, know those three words. Well, it's a good start to know them. But there's far more to that than knowing. Although, without knowing, we probably would never pay attention to them. Anicca, impermanence. Dukkha, the unsatisfactoriness which we often notice and we actually know about but just as often don't want to know about. And anatta, translated as non-self, but a really more impactful translation is the coalescence or non-substantiality. I prefer coalescence. There's no core to anything. It doesn't have an inner solidity. If you think a moment about an onion, that's exactly what it's like. All of you must have, at one time or another in your lives, peeled an onion. And what happens when you come to the end of it? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing there. No core. Okay, that's what it is. Corelessness. Literally translated, it means non, non-me, non-I. Atta is I or me, and non, uh, un is the negative syllable. un atta. But there's so much bandying about with that and so much misunderstanding and then very often trying to say that anatta and sunyata are not the same 
so many words being used as concepts, it doesn't help. Just think of an onion and that's it. Uh, actually, the Buddha didn't use onion. He used the trunk of a banana tree. But you may never have seen the inside of a trunk of a banana tree. I don't know if you have. You know it's exactly the same as an onion. There's nothing there. Looks very solid, doesn't it? Onions can be extremely hard and uh, look totally solid, and they are onion. And if you were to ask the onion, and if the onion could answer, the onion would say, of course I'm an onion. What else would I be? Can't you see? Well, that's what all of us answer, don't we? Of course I'm me. Can't you see? Well, there we are. It's all over the place. Even our vegetables. <laughs> so what we actually have to do and need to do in order to make a go of the uh, understanding of the three characteristics is to investigate all three. We might not have the time to go into depth on all three. We have already been talking about the first one. And it's always the first one in all scriptures. Always says Anicca first, impermanence. Because it is the easiest to see. And it lends itself the least to argument. The other two can have beautiful arguments which sound even almost logical. With impermanence, the argumentation is practically non-existent. We have already spoken about the fact that if we were to look at what is really happening, in other words, the understood experience, we would know that our breathing Every breath is totally impermanent. It's got to be. If, it's not, if the in-breath is not followed by the out-breath, we'll be dead in a very short period of time. And the out-breath by an in-breath. But mankind takes that for granted, including us, until the moment comes when we lose our breath. And then we get panicked. We get afraid, we, we feel that the sky is falling in on us because we can't breathe properly. But until then, we just accept the fact that it goes in and out without ever looking at the actuality, what that means for us. It means that there is no solid breath anywhere. If we don't suck it in and bring it out again, there's no human being. There is no solid breath anywhere. There's air around us, which is also, of course, in movement. And if we don't partake of it, do something about it, which comes, of course, automatically, because it's one of our automatic uh, body functions, we wouldn't be here. And when we find that, discover that in meditation, and I have already suggested to you that when the mind is either sleepy or agitated, in both cases, it can't become quiet and tranquil. When it's sleepy, it falls asleep. When it's agitated, it goes the other way. So if that is the case, to look at the impermanence of each breath that happens, instead of trying to become tranquil. When we look at the impermanence of each breath that happens and really take it in, not just say to ourselves, yeah, of course it's impermanent, so what? I mean, that too happens naturally but we actually experience this change that takes place in seconds. We can equally 
experience the change that takes place in our thoughts and our emotions. If you have a digital clock, it's very helpful. Look at it. Every second disappears. Never to be resurrected. That particular second will never come back. It's gone. That it looks the same after 12 hours on that little digital clock and that each in-breath looks the same or feels the same as the previous one is the reason why we are lulled into the mistaken view of solidity. Continuity covers over the impermanence of everything that exists. It happens over and over again. We've been getting up every morning for the past 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, whatever. And every morning we got out of bed and we realized that's me. And it's much too early or it's too cold and I don't like it or I do like it. But it's definitely me experiencing it every single morning. But that the last morning is long gone and can never come back. And that this particular moment of getting up the next morning can also never come back. That that is an entity in itself which has already vanished and disappeared while it is happening never enters our mind. All that enters our mind is how we can cope with it. If we were to pay attention what is really happening, we wouldn't have to try and cope with it. It copes by itself because it's so short-lived that it doesn't need any particular coping. It's just happening. This being in the moment, being in the present, is what we have to learn in meditation, hopefully do learn in meditation, and can also translate into daily living. When we do, problems dissolve. And this is what I meant when I mentioned that we don't have to ask anybody how to solve our problems although there are quite a number of people who make a living out of that, telling others how to solve their problems. Um, we don't have to. All we have to do is practice. And when we are in a position to practice, not everybody is in a position to practice, obviously. But if we are in a position to practice, problems dissolve. Because the problems that happened some time ago don't have to be attended to. They're gone. And the problems that might occur in some time to come, well, they don't have to be attended to. They haven't even happened yet. So what could be the problem if one watches one breath or one second on a digital clock or knows that one is putting one's feet on the ground? What possible problem could there be? If people were to practice that, and believe me, very few will, so we don't have to be afraid that this is going to happen. Many people would leave, lose their livelihood, but it's not going to happen, so don't worry. Very few people actually do it. The only sad thing is that even those people who know about it don't do it. We've all heard the word mindfulness till it comes out of our ears over and over again. The only thing that's missing is doing it. And when we actually do it, and here we have a wonderful chance to do it in these very quiet and peaceful surroundings, and I dare say you have also uh, practiced it outside of meditation as we have discussed, the ordinary, everyday kind of mindfulness which we can all um, relate to changes into the spiritual mindfulness which gives us an inkling and a taste of impermanence. Now impermanence on the larger scale is very easy to see, one gets born and one dies. We all know that too. And of course that is part 
of our experience, of everybody's experience. But it seems so far removed from each other that it doesn't seem to enter into everyday consciousness. But the actuality of everything that we do being of an impermanent nature, whether it's a movement of the body or a thought or an emotion or the breath or the heartbeat, whatever it may be, or the intake of food, which has to obviously change into digestion and then the elimination. Everything has to change constantly. If it doesn't do that anymore, we are a corpse. As long as we are a human being, everything has to go in that way. Changing, changing, changing. Moving, moving, moving. Now, if we actually do take that in as a personal experience, what happens there, or what one could expect to happen, is that we no longer hang on to the things we think we ought to have, we ought to know, and we ought to be. There are no oughts. Things are as they are. And we see them moving. Now, I often use, and I have already used, but I'll repeat it, the simile of a flowing stream. Just picture a flowing stream for a moment. It's very easy to do. We're exactly the same. There's always water. But can you ever find the same drop of water one second after another? Or are they completely changed? Now you know what happens in a flowing stream. We are the same. And that impermanence that I'm referring to there is that constant change which happens within us from millisecond to millisecond including not only the ones I've mentioned the thoughts, the emotions, the breath, the heartbeat the whole body there is constant death and rebirth in the whole body naturally we don't notice it unless we are very concentrated in meditation and can actually have an inkling what this constant movement is all about. Not movement outwardly, where we move our limbs, but inwardly. That constant inward movement is exactly the same as the flowing of a stream. When we look at a stream that flows, what we see is water. And if it doesn't flow very fast, we might think we're looking at the same water all the time. Well, that's what we do with ourselves. We look at ourselves and we think we see the same person all the time. But in reality, that same person has already flown away in all aspects. And there's another one not so easily discernible immediately in the mirror. But that's why I always recommend and have already recommended to get out your old photo albums and hold them up against the mirror and then stand next to it. And what you find is a tiny little person with your name underneath and that's me and then somebody standing next to it that doesn't look anything like it. And that has taken 30, 40, 50 years to change like that. But could it have jumped from the little me to that grown-up me? Or what happens? Constant change. It happens every millisecond. And that's why it's also absurd to try to think of the things of the past and then feel guilty about them or think of things of the past and blame anybody for them. That person who did them and the person that it was done to no longer exists. All that exists 
is a nebulous memory. Our memory is also not perfect. When you get a car accident and you have six bystanders, you usually get seven opinions. So our memories are discolored by our own preferences. So the person who has experienced the past and the person who now thinks about that they're not the same. They have a relationship, certainly, but they're not the same. So it doesn't really work to try to do anything about that past person or the past people that were involved with that past person. That's one thing that we can learn from that. And the other thing is that we can let go of this belief, it's just a belief, in our own solidity when we recognize the flowing of the stream within ourselves. This wrong belief of our solidity makes everything extremely difficult because it's in the belief in something that doesn't exist. So when we believe in something that doesn't exist, it certainly doesn't make life easy because we want to prove that it does exist somehow or other we want to get confirmation and since everybody believes the same thing we think we're getting confirmation and yet we're always looking for some support system for that mistaken view the support system which is supposed to arise out of appreciation love um, conformity with our views, all the things that we need to make sure that we are really what we think we are. And unfortunately, it spells disaster. Because first of all, we are not what we think we are. And secondly, everybody else is also looking for that support system. So they very often forget to give it to us. And then we feel very... Um, bereft because we haven't got the support for this belief that we have. The belief that we have does not take into account reality. And this is what the Buddha tried to teach and taught successfully to many thousands of people. Yet he said, there are only few people with little dust in their eyes. It's one of his expressions and that's why one of my books is called that, little dust in the inner eye, of course. Most people can't relate to this. That all the belief system that everybody lives by is a viewpoint. And because it's a viewpoint, it's not based on reality. It is a superficial reality. It's a relative reality, we usually call it. In the relative reality, we're all sitting on our own little pillow. In the relative reality, we all eat our own food. We are all bounded by the limits of this body. We think our own thoughts. We have our own likes and dislikes. We look different from everybody else. That's in the relative reality quite true. And we deal with that relative reality in everyday life. But if we haven't had a glimpse of absolute reality, everyday life is not easy. It's very difficult because we're trying to make something happen which can never happen. We're trying to make solid what is obviously, obviously transparent. So the more we become aware of impermanence, in all that arises within us, the easier it will be to find that transparent aspect of ourselves. It doesn't mean that we can now look through that body and see the other side of it. It means that we don't long, no longer believe in the solidity of it. It's constantly changing. We learned in school for me many, many years ago, 
but I have not forgotten it, that every seven years all of the cells of the body are replaced. You might remember that one. I didn't understand a word of that. I thought, now how are they going to do that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm already ten, so now I had new cells at seven. What's going to happen at fourteen? They're going to take them out and put new ones in? <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't going to happen. It took me many years later to realize what this really meant. Either I was particularly dense or we didn't have a very good teacher. Um, what it really means to us when we look at impermanence, it means that we know scientifically, we have known for ages that the cells in our body disintegrate and new ones arise and that in within seven years they've all done it. Well, how can we speak of the same person and the same body? Just because there's continuity, there is memory. But memory does not prove that there is no change. Memory is selective. Just think for a moment, what have you remembered from this course so far? Selective. Maybe you have remembered that which you knew anyway. That's the first thing we usually remember. Or you may have remembered something that is totally different from anything that you've heard before. But what about the rest? We're going to need the tapes. <coughs> We're lucky we have these nowadays. It would have been nice if we had them at the Buddhist time. And we wouldn't need these. So our selecti sel selection in memory is only that which we feel we can easily deal with. And since most people find it just enough to cope with in everyday life what is expected, what they think is expected of them. None of this enters into their awareness, into their consciousness. And yet, once it does, and we flow with that stream, then we have made life much easier for ourselves. I think that here in California, it's quite important to make a statement about flowing with the stream because this is where it all started. Flowing with the stream doesn't mean that you don't do anything. It also doesn't mean that you, uh, the, the way you wear your hair or what kind of clothes you wear. And it doesn't mean what you eat and it doesn't mean what you um, reject. It's got nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. Flowing with the stream means that you see yourself as a flowing stream which is changing from moment to moment and that while you are flowing and that means you are alive, one does the best one can to be a beautiful stream but one has no idea that that which is appearing now is going to again appear a moment later. Because as beautiful as that stream may be, it changes its consistency, it changes its movement all the time. I believe, I hope, that this simile of a flowing stream is helpful. Because most people will agree, in fact practically everybody, will agree to impermanence. And that's where it ends. Agreement's very nice. At least we don't have arguments. But it doesn't do a thing for one's own personal evolution. It's just agreeing with something that the great genius, the Buddha's mind, told us. And since we can see the logic of it, we will agree. We've got to live it got to live accordingly, which means 
that we constantly remember it. And this is actually the second step on the seven factors of enlightenment, that we look at phenomena, which means everything. In Pali it's the word dhammas, and it just means everything. In the light of changeability, transiency, impermanence, and never forget. Now, never forget, of course, that's a tall order, so we need to begin somewhere. Look at your movements, intentional and involuntary, and see how impermanent they are. Don't think about your problems, think about your movements. When you think about your movements and become aware of them, you haven't got a problem. Why do people make themselves unhappy? I think the answer is because they haven't found out that they are the ones that are doing it and that they could just as well make themselves happy. It's not that kind of happiness which comes from the understanding of impermanence, the living of impermanence, is not a joyful dancing around. It's an inner quietude. It's just a being at ease. I think it is very important that we now touch upon the second one of the three characteristics. We all know the word dukkha, we have all been experiencing it, but the uh, ordinary human reaction is, I don't want to know about it. And according to the Buddhist teaching, for instance, in his enlightenment statement, the first noble truth is the noble truth of Dukkha. In the transcendental dependent arising, which is the way from our ordinary state of being to enlightenment, the first step is Dukkha. Now often people who don't know anything about the Buddha's teaching will then say, oh, he taught suffering, huh? How very sad, how very unpleasant. I don't need to be taught suffering, I've had enough of that. Yes, uh, that is a superficial view and that can be seen like that. And then one has to, if one wants to, go into a long explanation. The reality of it is, the actuality of the Buddha's teaching is the fact that he wanted us to look at Dukkha to see it quite clearly and thereby arouse in ourselves the urgency to get out of it. Now what we usually do in order to get out of Dukkha is a whole list of escape mechanisms. Naturally everybody wants to get out of Dukkha. Nobody likes to have pain or suffer or be uncomfortable or any of those things that we know. It's inbuilt in us. Also, because it's inbuilt that we don't really appreciate Dukkha, we can easily see that what we want, really want, is happiness. And rightly so. Every person in the world looks for happiness and peace. The only trouble with that is that we most of the time look in the wrong place where it's not available. We think it's available. And then, after having found out that we have looked in the wrong place, that it was a mistake, then we most of the time think that ah, next time I'll be much cleverer. Now I know what to avoid. So I'm going to get the right 
partner, the right place to live, the right diet, the right teacher, the right job, what else, the right yoga exercises, I'm going to do it much better next time. So we do it better next time. And we get all those things right, and then what happens? Then we are dependent upon all those things to remain happy. And all those things change just as much as we do. And then we look again, we think, hmm, must have made a mistake. Maybe this one wasn't quite right. But I'm much cleverer now. I can really do it. Then comes the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, and all they do is change the names. The, the reality of it is that we are dependent upon outer conditions which are never exactly the way we want them. What the Buddha taught was not that we're supposed to have dukkha, which is a misunderstanding which people often have uh, that haven't heard much of the te- or none of the teaching. That's not at all what he taught. He taught that we should recognize it, the reality of it, and then get on the path of spiritual emancipation so that eventually dukkha is no longer present within. Now we have the first and second noble truth, and I mentioned it yesterday, briefly and I would like to mention it again and urge you to try out whether it really works. He said the first noble truth is that there's dukkha in all existence. And the second noble truth that dukkha has only one single cause. Now isn't that nice? Makes it so easy. One single cause. Often we think, oh, dukkha exists because the uh, people around me are not nice, the weather isn't nice, my income isn't good enough. Uh, All sorts of reasons. But we don't even have to look for any reason whatsoever. There's only one cause and that's craving, which includes not wanting. So it's wanting or not wanting. And that's dukkha. Because both depict a certain disquiet within ourselves. They depict a lack of something when we want it and an experience within of something which we don't quite approve of. The craving which actually causes dukkha is one which is far more deep-seated and one which we should at least know about even if we can't do anything about it just yet. The craving which the Buddha talks about is our craving to be here. Or you can say our craving to be somebody. It's usually just called the craving to be. But that's possibly too short to really give the sense of it. We want to be somebody. Now, the other side of the coin is the craving not to be, which arises when we are either depressed or very often in the teens suicidal ideas or when we are um, very much catering to other people's wishes and then very often that arises the craving not to be but the craving to be is far more common and they both are based on the same delusion whether we have inferiority complexes or superiority complexes makes absolutely no difference. They are all based on the me delusion. So that idea that we first have to find the ego before we can get rid of it, there isn't a person alive that hasn't got one because we wouldn't be here if we didn't have one. We can't get born without it. It's that which brings us 
to birth. I've often heard this idea, and that's why I'm mentioning it and like to emphasize it. There is no such thing as a person that hasn't got an ego. They might be manifesting it in a peculiar way by uh, trying to be very accommodating and never voicing their own opinions. Now, well, that's just their way of manifesting their ego. Another person likes to manifest the ego by always being right. And both are extremes. Most people do in between. But we can't get born without it. Because we have the craving to be, we get born. And the craving to be can only exist when there's someone there that's got it. If there's nobody there, there cannot be a craving. So the first and second noble truths should at least be understood this far. That there is dissatisfaction, unfulfillment, there are pains, there are sorrows, there are worries, dislikes, and they're due to the fact that we want something. Now I've already suggested to you, and I'd like to suggest it again, try this out for yourself. If there's anything in your life at this present moment, may it be a knee pain, a back pain, an unpleasant person, uh, somebody who's ill, whom you'd rather have well, anything at all that is creating an unhappiness within, drop the idea that you want it different. And for that one second, having dropped it, no dukkha. And this is what the Buddha taught. He taught that if we stop rummaging around trying to get what we think we ought to have, which is strictly a personal opinion, and trying to get rid of what we think we ought not to have, which is also a strictly a personal opinion, we don't have dukkha. So we need to see, in order to get at dukkha, in its actuality, we need to see, first of all, that it is everywhere to be found. We, are no, we don't have a monopoly on it, which is another mistaken view. We always think, uh, oh, look at me, it's all so difficult. These people are all smiling, they don't have any. That's another mistaken view. Smiling is friendliness and very nice. Everybody's got dukkha. There's no way one can get out before one is almost anyway enlightened. Possibly fully, but almost enlightened. Until then, everybody's got dukkha. Physical dukkha, body dukkha, mental, emotional dukkha. And the only reason we have it is because we want what we haven't got and we want to get rid of things that we do have. Now, things don't necessarily mean material things. They most often mean people. Our greatest difficulties are always with our relationships. <coughs> and we don't want that and we want it different and that sort of thing. So try it out and see if that's true by dropping what's creating dukkha. And then you will be able to see that the Buddha's only intent in teaching about dukkha was the fact that if we see it clearly, we become imbued with urgency to practice so that we can one day <coughs> deal with it in a manner which no longer causes suffering. The way we deal with it at this time is pretty much the same escape pattern for everybody. Now, the first thing that you know is when you sit and it hurts. You try to get away from it, okay? That's what we do in daily life. Something is not pleasant, whatever that may be. 
so we would like to escape. We either remove ourselves or we try to remove the trigger. The other person, the situation. In other words, we want to change something, something outside of ourselves. If that's our only response to Dukkha, we'll never make it because always something new arises that we'd like to change. It does not necessarily mean that we can't change outside conditions. The Buddha did teach that when we have tried everything in our power to be loving and compassionate and helpful and the situation is still one that makes one constantly negative, it's much better to get out of that situation because becoming negative is no help. When we get out of a certain situation, then not to blame the other person or the situation, but to realize we are very much engaged in changing things around us. And they're all material things, they're all outward things. Everything that's outward is a material thing. And because we try to do that, we have little time and energy left for changing the inward thing. And the Buddha's path is changing inwardly. Remember I showed you that little jack-in-the-box that's sitting inside the only way it won't jump out if it's been taken away. Just the box left. No little doll in there that jumps. One of the worst mistakes we make when we have unpleasantness, dukkha, is that we blame the trigger. One of the sentences that one should always remember is don't blame the trigger. Remember the little jack-in-the-box. Don't blame the one that's hitting the box so that it jumps out. We all have certain buttons that people can press. Some of us have more buttons than others. Some have buttons that stick so far out that practically everybody presses them. <laughs> and some of us have been able to hide our buttons a bit more. But when they get pressed, then Jack in the Box jumps out. So blaming the trigger is foolishness. Everybody plays that game. But when you stop playing that, you have started on spiritual evolution. There is nobody that is to blame that you have that little jack-in-the-box sitting inside. That's how we get born. We get born with six roots. In Pali they're called mula, M-U-L-A. Three wholesome, three unwholesome. The unwholesome ones hate greed and delusion and the wholesome ones love, generosity and wisdom. We've got it all sitting in there. And sometimes, mind you, the good ones jump out. And then we also think that's due to a trigger. Because that particular trigger gave us a nice feeling. A pleasant one, like a beautiful rose bush, give us a pleasant feeling. So what comes out is a feeling of feeling very well, a well-being, feeling of well-being, a recognition of beauty, a feeling of being at ease. So what do we do? We think it's due to a rose bush, and then the mind starts working 
I've got to plant a rose bush. I've got to find out what the name of this one is. I've got to get the same one. And so when we do, we plant the same rose bush. And after having had it for one or two years, we don't even see it anymore. We think it's a trigger. Mind you, that's not to say we shouldn't plant rose bushes. We do it all the time. But what it means is that we don't think anymore at any time that what happens through our senses is what makes us happy or unhappy. What happens through our senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling and thinking, are the triggers. And how we deal with them, that's our own development. So when there is dukkha, we are liable to blame, we're liable to run away, but we're also liable to distract ourselves. And since everybody has a lot of dukkha, and a lot of people are very clever at trying to find things, how they can make a very good living, we have been absolutely flooded with possibilities to distract ourselves. All we have to do these days is press a button. And we press a button, we don't even have to get up from our chair. We can have a button in our hand and press it, and bingo, there's a distraction. Or we press a few buttons on a telephone, or we pick out a novel, or we get another video, or we visit the neighbors, or whatever. Distraction is one of our favorite ways of trying to escape from dukkha. Now, in one respect, it has validity. If we are unable to deal with dukkha and become more and more unhappy, it is valid, when we know what we're doing, to distract ourselves until the mind has enough strength again to deal with the dukkha in the um, appropriate manner, seeing it for what it is, it can only be one of two things. Either I'm not getting what I want, or I'm getting what I don't want. Nothing else. If you will examine your own dukkha with those two as guidelines, you will find there's no other answer. That's it. And then, having seen that, and as I said, it's all right to distract oneself if one can't deal with it. But after having distracted oneself, get back to dealing with it. And then it see whether it's wanting to get rid of or wanting to get. And as you see that it's one of those, then ask yourself questions. Why do I want it? What does it do for me when I have it? And you will find what it does for you when you have it, if you're really absolutely intent on having it, it supports the ego illusion. Everything we have and want to get, everything we identify with, supports our ego illusion. And if something is lacking, missing, got lost, we feel as if our ego has got a dent in it and we'd like to make that dent smooth again. Investigate it. Find out. It's the only way to know. There are no other ways. One has to experience it. And since dukkha is universal, there's no problem in experiencing it and experiencing the reactions and experiencing why we're having the reactions. It's not made difficult for us. All we have to do is look at ourselves and stop thinking of the trigger. If we don't do that in daily living, we haven't found a spiritual path yet. Obviously, meditation, and I will say this again and again, is necessary and skillful means, but that's all it is. 
necessary and skillful means in Pali Upachaya. But it needs to be translated into the reality of everyday living. So every t- time we get upset, irate, angry, depressed, unhappy, investigate. What are you not getting that you want? Or what are you getting that you don't want? And as you get the answer, then investigate. Why do I have to have that? What's the reason for it? And when you ask that question, you might actually already at that point realize you don't have to have it. It's just an idea. We operate with so many ideas which then translate into so many emotions that we have lost the knack and the ability to get to it their rea- reality, to get to the point where they arise. We're constantly concerned with what makes them arise outside of us. And yet, we all know, we don't live outside of ourselves, we live inside ourselves. Our life quality is dependent upon our inner being. And that what we can give to others is entirely dependent upon what we actually are. Not who we are, what we are. Because there is no who. That's all an idea. That there's going to be a who somewhere. Or that I'm one of them. But if we actually have an interest in helping others, we've got to help ourselves. And then we can translate that into emanating it, which can be quite without words. It really isn't, but it could be. It doesn't have to have words. Words are the fingers that point to the moon, but they're certainly not the moon themselves. That's one of the Zen sayings. They have most pertinent and very succinct sayings. So, if we actually examine what happens in our daily life, we don't have to have great tragedies. We don't have to have immense dissatisfactions. We can, happens. And then, of course, we are living through a very difficult time and have all sorts of problems and talk to other people on how to solve them. But let's just say none of this is happening. Let's just say it's an ordinary, everyday kind of happening from morning to night. What happens? How often are we really and truly happy? How often are we really and truly unhappy? And how often do are we neither are just sort of floating along with what's going on without knowing exactly? As long as we haven't found our footing in being totally responsible for our own happiness and unhappiness, we haven't started practice. Meditation, the means. The practice happens from morning to night. And that kind of practice that happens from morning to night is the one that makes a person. That's what makes it how the quality of our life is actually happening. Because we live according to our feelings. Dukkha is a feeling. It's unhappiness, unfulfillment, And it is that which actually brings us to meditation. We might think that because our friend has gone, we go, or because we haven't, we've heard it's nice there, or it's something that will make us happy, or we may have heard that uh, we can uh, then do better yoga or whatever. But actually, we come to meditation because we have dukkha and would like to find a way out of it. Examine that too. Don't take anything for granted 
don't believe it or disbelieve it, look at it and see whether it's applicable. Now most of the dukkha that we have, which goes on from morning to night, we do not recognize. Why? Because we don't want to recognize it. We feel we've got enough of the heavy kind that we don't want to see the kind that we can cope with. But that's foolish. Because the ordinary, everyday kind that goes on from morning to night, that's the one we want to get out of. The other kind, where it's really heavy, that we think we can manage if we act a little clever. But the morning to night kind, the ordinary kind, there's nothing to be clever about. It just is. Now what happens? A lot of dukkha with the body. It's constantly clamoring for attention. Wake up in the morning and it's too cold. Then have to go to the toilet. Absolutely essential. Then have to eat something. Have to drink something. If it's too much, tummy ache. If it's not enough, hungry. Then have to sit down. And the knees don't like it. And the back doesn't like it. And the, maybe there's even a headache. And then there comes a toothache. Or then having sat for a while, then want to get up because it gets uncomfortable. Having got up, gets tiring. Want to sit down again. <laughs> then having sat down again, also not comfortable, must walk a bit. Okay, go and walk. After a while, very tiring, too much sunshine, it's too hot, so I have to go in the shade. Sit standing in the shade or sitting in the shade, too cold, must get back in the sun. <laughs> it's all the body. Constant affairs with the body. It's a, a constant escape mechanism trying to get this body comfortable. So then people love to go to sleep because at least... They don't feel the body so much then. <laughs> it's also another escape mechanism, of course. The only really valid escape from all this body dukkha is totally concentrated meditation. At the time of concentrated meditation, really concentrated, the body does not exist. And this is what the Buddha experienced when he did the meditative absorptions. But as he came out of them, as you undoubtedly have to, he realized there was dukkha again. So there has to be something else other than being away from the body. Because you can't be away from the body while we're still alive. We can only be away from it temporarily. So that's when he realized and went on the search for the deepest insight that he could find so that body dukkha was no longer a cause for suffering. And this is a very important aspect of dukkha. And I like to emphasize that so that it hopefully is understood. Dukkha is, period but we don't have to suffer from it. And that's the whole difference. We may have, let's say, a life-threatening disease, okay? But we don't have to suffer from it. We may have the um, loss of a loved one, but we don't have to suffer from it. Dukkha is, it is everywhere to be seen. It is in a small, medium, or large measure. It's constantly there because everything is of a changeable nature. And whatever changes produces friction. And friction is never pleasant. But we need not suffer from it. And that's what the Buddha taught. He taught Dukkha is, but no suffering. And the way we don't suffer from it is first by its recognition. We recognize it. It's in the body, it's in the mind, it's everywhere to be found. But when the mind does not react to the body, when the mind does not react 
to the situation, the non-reaction, there's no suffering. In respect to the physical dukkha, the Buddha said, I think I mentioned it, but I will say it again, that the enlightened person has one arrow that hits them, whereas the unenlightened has two. The one arrow that hits the enlightened one is the unpleasantness in the body, which comes in small or larger measure. But the mind stays at ease because the mind of the enlightened person knows that this is just the body, but not me. And not only knows it, but feels it. And this is a big difference between knowing the teaching and being the teaching. First you know, obviously, you've got to find out. But then you actually feel it. And when you feel it, then you are it. If you feel loving kindness, then you are loving. If you feel anger, then you are angry. It's that simple. The whole of the pathway depends on feeling. The whole of the pathway of the meditation, of the concentrated meditation, depends on feeling. So the enlightened one has one arrow. Body has the same unpleasantness, the same demands that an unenlightened person's body has. But the mind stays at ease. And the unenlightened one has all these body difficulties and demands and the mind reacts. And this is then suffering. Suffering from the dukkha that the body produces. If we don't react to whatever is happening, but just let it flow with that stream of impermanence, how can we suffer? So there is nothing to suffer if we recognize the reality of Dukkha. Reality which is all around us, everywhere within us, within everybody, and which is a f one of the three characteristics of the whole of existence, not just human existence, any existence. Because of its changeable nature, there is friction, and friction creates unpleasantness. 